this hour, we are going to be talking about reconstituting cabinet, the governance standard. It's necessary to have because we know in a couple of days, uh, or at least soon, this will be happening. Our guest for this hour is FCS Jeremiah N. Karanja, the CEO of the Institute of Certified Secretaries, and he's here with us this morning. Jeremiah, good morning. Good morning to you. Karibu sana. Asante. Welcome to Kenya's Biggest Conversation. Thank you. This is the hot seat of the Situation Room. Yes. And we'll be looking at some diverse matters this morning, will we not? Mm. and uh, then what it takes to uh, put together a cabinet which is in the offing it's going mm. to happen mm. are all eyes on the president especially after you know what has happened over the last three weeks mm. and what is he going to do mm. and in this case maybe pointers as to what should he do mm. but before we get into the conversation proper yes. as we do in the mm. situation room city's going to welcome you with today's proverb your job is to tell us what it means to you and how you would interpret it. Okay. Sounds good? Interpret it rather. Yeah. Yes. Uh, proverbs for this week come from the island republic of Cabo Verde or Cape Verde, some people call it. Mm. I know it perfectly. Prevents the wasp from learning to make honey. Hmm. I know it perfectly. Mm -hmm. Prevents the wasp from, from learning. learning. The wasp. For, from learning to, <laughs> to make, make honey. honey. <laughs> is this supposed to be an exam? <laughs> and what is the pass mark? <laughs> well, no. Uh, when, when we ask for your opinion, <laughs> because the nature of Proverbs is such that it is not possible to have a uniform interpretation. Yes. So someone has to tell you how they relate to the proverb. Yes. And that's what we're asking you. Uh, so it is not an exam. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, I'll think about it as we proceed. <laughs> Don't worry, my friend. This yes. one, yes. you can't think as we proceed. Uh -huh. You have to tell us what you think. Mm, you have to tell us. <laughs> I have to think in, about it. In whatever way it, you interpret it. Yes, yes. Mm. Yeah, uh, my thought would be, because uh, you are saying, I know it well. It prevents to make honey. The, the wasp from making honey. It prevents the wasp from making honey. Yes. Mm. Uh, I would think, uh, and I want to relate to our Kenyan uh, situation, uh, context, uh, where uh, there are things that, as a country, we are well endowed, uh, but there are things that prevent us from getting to Canaan mm. and harvesting the honey mm. uh, that we have always wanted to harvest because we think we know everything yes and ah. part of it is our ethical practices mm -hmm. yes mm. Yeah. interesting mm. okay so even as we get into this i mean think look <laughs> city gives out points i don't know how many giving him a million <laughs> well no uh, the the you know the <laughs> let me go by what i said earlier on mm -hmm. when someone gives you the opinion it's an opportunity for you to learn from that opinion mm -hmm. because they've told you an interpretation that you perhaps had not thought of yes indeed yes so uh, now that yes. is the beauty of asking someone to tell you what they think of the problem <laughs> there you go yes thank you so uh jeremiah uh, look Thank you for being here. Um, mm -hmm. And even as we get into this conversation, you are the uh, CEO of the Institute of, S of Certified Secretaries. Yes. What's that? Okay. Please, let's start off from there so, you can, so we can know where we are all coming from. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the Institute of Certified Secretaries, uh, the full name is called Institute of Certified Public Secretaries of Kenya. Public Secretaries. Mm -hmm. ICPSK is created at an act of parliament, mm -hmm. uh, CAP 534 of the laws of Kenya, and our mandate is to promote good governance. Mm -hmm. Our members are called certified secretaries, and depending on the organizations which they serve, for instance, in standard group, you have company secretary, mm -hmm. who is our member. In the public sector, they are called corporation secretaries or board secretaries, council secretaries, and uh, they are uh, made it in those organizations is to promote governance and ethical standards. Mm -hmm. uh, they support boards, they support uh, the organization and stakeholders on all matters mm -hmm. governance within those institutions. Okay. Thank you. With a view to ensure that good governance is taking place sure. in the public sector. Sure. Okay. So, how many um, members around the country, how many people are involved mm. in this institute? We are currently approaching 5,000, okay. uh, around 5,000 members mm -hmm. uh, of the institute spread all over the country. Uh, among the areas, for example, where our members are involved in the county governments, 
you have a body called public, uh, the county public service board. Mm -hmm. Each of the county public service board has a secretary who is also the CEO of the board. Mm -hmm. That is the equivalent of the PSC public service commission. Mm -hmm. uh, that secretary is our member. Every state corporation mm -hmm. uh, is supposed to have a corporation secretary. Mm -hmm. uh, all public entities are supposed to have a company secretary. Uh, so they are spread across various sectors. There are those in private practice. Uh, maybe you have uh, your own uh, small company. Uh, company secretaries see organizations from what I would call from the womb to the tomb. Mm. Right from when the organization is formed, they help you to incorporate. They help you on matters, governance, guide you. Until if you decide to kill the company for whatever reason, they will help you in dissolving and striking off. Yes. Okay. Mm. So let's look at what the tenets of good government are, because now we know that that happens. Mm -hmm. And of course, now we're talking about, you know, instituting uh, a, a proper cabinet, mm. um, which like we know is in the offing, it's going to happen. Mm. So in order to constitute a right cabinet, you have to be thinking along the lines of good governance. Yes. What is good governance? I mean, we use it, we throw it, we've been throwing this word around a lot, mm. almost becoming a buzzword. Yeah. So what is good governance from your point of view? Now, just to put in uh, simple language, good governance yeah, is the way organizations are led, uh, how the processes, the procedures, you have policies that you have put in place, ensuring that those policies are followed. Mm -hmm. So in the context of an organization like this one, uh, you have right from the shareholders to the board to senior management, their mm -hmm. policies, their constitutive documents, and which uh, each one of us is supposed to adhere to. Mm -hmm. uh, so what differentiate one organization to the other for us to say that this is following good governance practices and this one is not, is the ability to follow those laid down procedures effectively uh, for achievement of the laid down goals. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Mm. And how do we now apply that to governing? government? Government. Now, to government, mm. one, government is made is a complex animal mm. uh, made up of so many things, including these institutions that we are talking about. Mm. Uh, for example, if I take the case of cabinet, uh, each cabinet secretary, of course, is responsible for several departments. And at them, those departments have organizations, uh, whether, uh, for example, if you take agriculture, uh, we have institutions under the Ministry of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. So each of these components, if is well governed, then it will lead to the overall achievement of the set goals for that cabinet sector and by extension the ministry. Mm -hmm. And now cumulatively when we put together all these ministries where each and every part is playing its, part, uh, its role properly, uh, then the fruits will be a good governance. Mm. Uh, so what I would say, uh, for instance, when we say Kenya, uh, because Kenya consistently over the last several years has been ranked very poorly mm. uh, in terms of our, our governance practices, mm. is because right from the institutions, each and every institution that we are dealing with, whether in private sector or public sector, because sometimes uh, it's very easy just to be throwing stones to the public sector. Mm. Uh, but we normally say, whenever there is, for instance, a corruption scandal, uh, there is something we call the unholy trinity. There must be a private uh, sector person who is a business person who is looking for profit. There must be a public sector person, that is government officer, facilitating the same and there must be a professional mm. that professional could be a company sector it could be an, an accountant mm. it could be a lawyer uh, so is <laughs> those very many people coming together is the result of what currently we are facing as a country them not doing their uh, proper role mm. yes okay so in another we don't know days, mm -hmm. a week or mm -hmm. two, mm -hmm. the president will take on the task of instituting a new cabinet. Yes. From the point of view whereby you practice this good governance and accountability every day, mm -hmm. what would you say would be the recipe for a cabinet that is acceptable then by the people mm -hmm. as well as one that is sure that it will do its job? Mm -hmm. We have a, a serious problem with this country. Mm -hmm. Uh, but before I go to the problem, let me say the 
uh, the good thing. The president, I think other than uh, the founding president, uh, Jomo Kenyatta, mm -hmm. the late, and the late uh, Kibaki, I don't think there is any other president who has had a golden opportunity of transforming this nation mm -hmm. than His Excellency, uh, the current president. Mm -hmm. uh, for the reason being, for the founding president, of course, he was starting uh, from a time when we had colonialism, so he had a blank check to institute whatever uh, that he thought fit for the nation. Mm -hmm. For the uh, for Honorable Kibaki, uh, you remember we are coming from a uh, Moi era of mm. misgovernance, and people voted him overwhelmingly, having been tired by the practices that we experienced then. Uh, you recall at one particular time, people were even arresting police officers yeah. on the roads who were mm. bribing. Uh, so he had the golden opportunity of instituting whatever good governance practices that uh, because the people are behind him. Now the current president, the current crisis that we are facing is a golden opportunity for him. I can assure you a few months ago if he had dared to fire the cabinet the way he did, mm. uh, we would have had Mutuetu, uh, mm. you had been targeted and all that. Right now, actually people are supporting him. Uh, because of the current crisis is during times of crisis when you are actually able to make the most significant change for the good of the people we are even the current constitution uh, we tried for many years uh, to uh, do away the previous constitution it became impossible until the 2007 crisis mm -hmm. And that's when we realize we have a serious problem and we have to sit down and do what is required for this nation. I think uh, we have gotten back to that situation mm. uh, where we must uh, come and say uh, this situation we are in cannot be resolved by the simple things that we have been dealing with, uh, but we have to come up with radical issues. And my, uh, one of the issues I would think is what I would call, uh, we need to have an ethical uh, revolution or moral rebirth as a nation. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think as a nation, we have a serious problem on matters ethics. And uh, the challenge the president has is that as long as it's the same Kenyans, mm -hmm. including myself, Maybe the reason why I have not stolen is because the position I'm in <laughs> has not given yeah, me yeah. ample opportunities to steal. <laughs> so we have so many thieves in this country, but who lack opportunities. Uh, so you fight people maybe in the opposition, they will keep on criticizing the government until when they get there. Then you realize they are just thieves who are waiting for a ripe opportunity to steal. Mm. Uh, so even as we think of the people that, we, that will be appointed, one of the things I think we need to institutionalize in this country is what I would call, we need a ethical revolution and a moral rebirth uh, to change our way of thinking in terms of ethical practices, mm -hmm. in terms of morality. Because even if we appoint people, and I'll be coming back later to what you have asked, but even if you ask, at, appoint people from the same pool, mm -hmm. uh, you still find uh, uh, the same challenges uh, coming back. Mm. Uh, having said that, uh, one of the things that I think the president needs to consider, uh, and in line with that uh, moral uh, rebirth, an ethical revolution, is the issue of an ethical leadership. Unethical leadership. Yes, mm -hmm. ethical leadership. Mm -hmm. And which has to start right at the top. There is a good book written which says the fish rots from the, the head. From the head. Yeah. So we have to start right from the top. If you look at the case, for instance, of Singapore, and we like giving that example mm. as one of the countries that went through a moral a rebirth mm -hmm. or ethical revolution, uh, where the founding uh, prime minister uh, led the process himself, setting a good, clear example right from the top. And therefore, having instituted that himself, he demanded the same for everyone yeah, else. You have people. to be accountable. Mm. And uh, once you do that, uh, you will find that once we start that process, that conversation, uh, very hard decisions which have to be made uh, right from the top to every level, uh, then uh, that is one of the areas that I think uh, we can get there.
Mm. Yeah. And somebody has to lead the charge. Yes. Is from that point of view of what you're looking at, it cannot just be a mushrooming of ideas and hope that people come together. Yes. From what you're saying, somebody has to lead the charge and say, yes. look, if we're going to see change, if mm. we're going to see a dropping of all of these uh, behavior, this impunity, mm. if we're going to see that somebody will then be accountable, or t- it has to be that somebody leads it. Is that what we're saying? Yes. That somebody must actually lead it for us to get where we are going. There needs to be somebody who takes charge, kind of like what we've seen um, um, in the past, that somebody actually does have to take charge and lead it from that point. Otherwise, we will not see it working. Is that what we're saying? Yes, uh, because Kenya prides itself to be 80% Christians. Mm-hmm. Allow me to uh, give two uh, scriptures from the Bible. Uh, one is found in the book of First Samuel, I think chapter 14. <coughs> Uh, it's about Samuel giving farewell speech after being a judge for the Israelites for a number of years. Mm. And it was a time that Israelites were complaining, we want a king like any other nation. Mm. Uh, but Samuel, as he is bidding farewell, he says, I start before you uh, so that you may judge you may judge me. Have I stolen anybody's, uh, anybody's donkey? Mm. If I have, I'll return it. Uh, twofold. Twofold. Yeah. Uh, just evaluate me. Is there anybody that I denied justice? That is where we need to get as a nation. When we will have leaders who can start before Kenyans and tell me, if you audit me, lifestyle audits that you have always been saying, and you find even a single shearing mm. that I'm ready to die, I'm ready to go to jail. Mm. Uh, the other uh, the other scripture, which is not very good to use at uh, this political context, but anyway, let me use it. I think is Luke chapter 9. Mm. It uh, talks of a guy called Zacchaeus, uh, the tax collector. People are being for his blood because uh, he had uh, conducted a bit, um, a number of injustices. Yes. Uh, and Jesus Christ comes to him. Uh, people are asking, how can you go to that man? Uh, but what he did is very commendable because what he said, uh, look, I'm ready to sell. Mm. If I have stolen anybody else's property, if I've taken something from somebody unjustly, I'll return to them fourfold. Mm. Uh, and because of that, he was accepted. Actually, the statement that Jesus says after that is that today you have become a son of Israel. Mm. So it has to start from there. We have leaders that we have elected, or others who have been appointed. Yeah. We have to start seeing a very strong demonstration and commitment that is not just rhetoric, uh, but people are committed. Uh, things that maybe uh, whatever we have accrued, and I put myself there because I'm also a leader. Mm. If there is anything that I have accrued unjustly, I need to start... Uh, returning the same so mm. that we regain the public trust uh, because that is what we are suffering uh, with now in terms of pub- the tr- uh, public cannot trust uh, the people who are in leadership. Mm. Yes. Do you see a situation where Kenyans as we know them and those in political leadership <laughs> will get to a point where they are actually returning <laughs> their ill-gotten goods which they have worked very hard to convince us <laughs> they worked hard to conduct business and to actually acquire? In a normal situation, that cannot happen. But I started by saying, sometimes people have, uh, I'll give a personal example. Uh, During COVID, I was one of those people who were not very uh, open to this issue of vaccination. Until I got COVID and I was uh, was unwell for a whole one month. Mm. And I was staring at death. Immediately, I I, (laughs) I recovered. I went very fast to ask, what are those, vac- where are those vaccinations? Mm. And I was the one searching for them previously. Actually, they have been brought in charge, you know, places of work, and I never bothered. So uh, sometimes when we are in our comfort zone, human beings generally are not uh, very easy to change. But what I think uh, the young people uh, have done now is something that uh, we have all of us and I put myself in that category of the young people. I'm not a Gen Z, but I'm a few years uh, <laughs> older than them. Mm. So in the same category. Uh, it's something that we have to think through uh, because it's not business as usual as is normally said. 
uh, we have to take to start thinking very seriously some of those issues that keep on bedeviling this nation, including uh, when we talk about ethical leadership and morality, there are some things which, although institutionalized, but they border on immorality. Uh, for instance, why would you, I'm a CEO, on, I'm on full-time employment with mm -hmm. a salary. Why would I, whenever I go to a meeting, then I claim a sitting allowance. Then I claim uh, so many things, perks, and I'm, yet that is what I'm employed to do. And for which you paid a salary. Yeah. Yes, for which I'm paid a salary. I will justify that SRC has approved that there is. Now, those are the things we are saying. We start need to rethink in how moral is that? Hmm. When we have police officers who we are paying uh, whatever amount we are paying them, and the teachers and the rest, we are talking of wage bill. And yet, when you look at only one arm of government, a few mm -hmm. arm of, we are taking almost all resources there. Mm -hmm. We need to start having that conversation. And when you look at it, actually, historically, I'm sure you know that uh, our members of parliament, just a few years ago, uh, maybe just before the Kibaki regime, you look at the, how much you used to pay them, compare even to university professors. It was reverse, which now we have inverted, and we are going up and up and up. Uh, when you look at other uh, uh, even developed countries, you compare mm. what is the, how much do they pay their representatives vis-a-vis exactly. ours. Uh, so level. those are some of the things I'm saying. As you put it, during the comfortable periods, mm. it is impossible to change. Yeah. But due to the current crisis, the president has an opportunity to start those very difficult uh, discussions, which otherwise you would not have gotten support of. But now with the current crisis, actually Kenyans will be behind him. This is an opportunity to start to have those conversations, is it not? Yeah. Let's open it up into the nitty gritty in mm. terms of who must he look for? Mm. Whom must he say this is the person that would then feed this need at this level? And we'll do that when we come back from the break. We're having a conversation this morning about reconstituting cabinet and who should be there from a president's point of view. Um, and so then as we um, continue with this conversation here, we're saying, um, as we say this now, uh, Jeremiah, even now we, we just continue with that. As we say this, the nitty gritty of whom he should be selecting, because we know that the number is not less than 14, not more than 22. Mm -hmm. Which men and women should actually be looked for? What should be the detail of who should be selected? Because that's what we're saying here. That cannot just, yes, we know you should not have a funny record. You shouldn't have this, that, the other thing. But what exactly should we say if this mark is not met, then the president has no business picking these individuals. Hmm. Yeah, uh, there are several factors that the president should consider. Uh, of course, we have mentioned some. Hmm. Uh, the other thing I would want to mention is uh, among the people he should not consider okay. is his political supporters. Uh, there is a book here I have. Uh, written by somebody called Taylor mm. uh, Pierce. Uh, he says that who got you here will not get you there. <laughs> there are people who supported <laughs> him as president to get to where he is. Those are among the people that he should even least consider. Mm. And he argues in this book, uh, the title of the book is called uh, Leadership Made in Africa. Mm. He argues in his book that whenever, as a head of state, uh, even this goes also to the governors, mm. whether, whenever you appoint the people who helped you into power, three things happen. Mm -hmm. One, they hold you captive. Yep. Uh, and secondly, you also feel you owe them, and therefore you are unable to hold them accountable. So actually he recommends, the first thing you do when you are elected, send those people as far away as, far as possible away from you. Because as long as they are around you, you never go beyond what you want to do or what they think. Mm -hmm. The first thing they do, once you appoint them, they supported you financially. They need first to recoup their what supports. they invested. Yes. 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 Uh, they had put their money there. It was an investment. Now it's time to harvest. Uh, so 
you'll be going two steps forward, they will be bringing you four steps Spark. backward. Mm. So said them either as a buzzard as or whatever. Uh, actually, in his book, he gives a very good scenario. He says, even if it means uh, you, uh, you negotiate financial compensation, mulipane, mm. mumalizane, but they are the least people that you should even consider. And yet that has been the practice, that there is a reward for folks who helped along the campaign trail, for example, and says, well, you know, come through your support here, give me your support base, because, you know, it will be good for you when you join me. Mm. But we're saying that these people actually end up being a stumbling block when it comes to that appointment. So stay clear of them. Yes. Okay, what else? Mm. Yes, uh, the, the other thing that you need to consider is to ensure that the cabinet, and again, this goes beyond the cabinet, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, by the way, as a leader, uh, you you know very little. The higher you go, mm -hmm. your knowledge of what you are leading reduces. reduces. Uh, because there are people below you who are the technocrats who are dealing with the details. So it uh, goes beyond the cabinet, but even to the levels below, uh, the boards of directors of those state corporations, because state corporations are the ones that actually execute the mandate of the ministry mm -hmm. uh, and the rest. Uh, so we need to ensure that this is based on merits, mm. uh, is people that are of good repute in terms of performance. There are people who have track record, we have seen what they have performed in the past, and we can trust them. And in addition to that, it uh, should also reflect the face of Kenya, which is what is everyone is saying. Mm -hmm. uh, our constitution requires us to do so. Uh, we need to ensure that is a broad based, uh, and I broad based here. I want to use it very <laughs> <laughs> careful. <laughs> very careful. I'm uh -huh. not referring to the political broad based, yeah. but I'm reading to the issue of inclusivity and diversity. Uh, but I think the most important, even as you look at the inclusivity and diversity, is the issue of merit. Mm. We have had an, a, a situation in this country uh, where. Uh, you have people in positions uh, of leadership and when you look at at all level even in private sector and you just wonder how did this person get to that position mm -hmm. uh, that person will not help you get there uh, number three is what the constitution provides uh, article 10 uh, the issues of integrity uh, principles and values mm -hmm. Uh, and it's not just an issue of having been convicted. Uh, it's also the issue of perception. Mm. Sometimes uh, when you talk about trust, trust is not necessarily because of something factual. If your spouse is, uh, does not trust you, sometimes it's not because they actually caught you, uh, but it's because when they look the way you look so and so, they mm. think there is something <laughs> beyond just looking. <laughs> yes, beyond yeah. that looking. Mm. So it doesn't matter how far you go convincing them and providing evidence. So what you need to work on is also the perception. Mm -hmm. So we cannot continue as a country claiming that so-and-so has not been convicted in a court of law. Yet the public perception is that that person is corrupt. Mm. And that perception alone should cause them first to start start aside and we first clear <coughs> that perception uh, so we should also be looking at people of high moral standards people who are who have proved who don't have any corruption <coughs> cases in the past uh, who people who when we look at the ESEC records mm. uh, we need to ensure that they have gone through uh, the proper vetting and they have come out uh, clear why would somebody select somebody who has a sketchy past? Sketchy performance, sketchy issues having to do with accountability. And here you are wanting, one would assume, to run government properly, to run a nation. Why would you select somebody who is iffy? Because he has other qualities beyond just being <laughs> sketchy. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. somebody can be as bent as a hairpin, mm -hmm. a bend, but they probably have other qualities mm. that are useful in a political situation. In mm. fact, you could argue that that quality that you find to be negative is probably a quality that somebody finds useful. Mm. So, in a political setup, the question of who fits in where 
is often a fairly interesting one. Mm. It's a labyrinth. You, what you think you know and what actually is the reason why that person is there may be two completely different things. The only thing that gives us an indication of what the thinking behind it is, if you have a pattern. Like this government, we've had people who've got genuinely questionable backgrounds. I mean, for goodness sake. Okay. I, I mean, mm. even if you had the best of intentions, I don't know, surely. Even you and I know. Yeah, that, yeah, that I mean, surely. Comes. Okay. Now, when such a person then ends up in a position of authority and power, and you say, wait, 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 wait. okay. Then you say, no, but we have to be cognizant and sensitive to the law. The law found this person to have been what? not guilty mm. so you ask the question okay they were not guilty but uh, had they committed that wrong before mm. or was it just an allegation a wild allegation mm. i think the requirement if i were to look at the probity and the strict uh nature of what it is that is required of a leadership it's not what we've got you doing even the whiff of it mm. is enough mm. yes mm. Should that be as strict a, a whip as should be used right now? Mm. Because the question also then would be, Jeremiah, that you who is making the selection of people who are as straight as rulers to be part of a government, then the demand would also be on you, the selector, to be just as straight, if not straighter. Mm. You know... I started by saying uh, we have a problem as a society. Mm. Actually, the reason why, whether it's the president, whether it's a governor or whichever leadership, uh, the, pro the reason why you go to those people is because that is what the society in the past has actually been demanding. Uh, if one of the ways uh, actually to be even to be elected as a leader in this country, mm. uh, just ensure you have a scandal. You <laughs> become popular overnight, mm. and then next day you first say that we are deep. My people, you see, we are being targeted. Mm. Then you go by for a political seat, and you'll be elected. Those are the people electing you, not the president. It's the people who have assessed this person, and they have determined this is the best leader that they want for themselves. Mm. So that's why I said it's a societal challenge. That And that's why I'm saying the solution, actually, when I look at our current crisis, is not just a political issue. It's an ethical, it's a moral issue. Uh, we have a society which doesn't appreciate, and I say this even from professionals, we don't appreciate some of these ethical requirements. Mm -hmm. So we have to start from there. Because why the governor or the president would go to appoint such persons uh, that you say are of questionable character, is because those are the popular people on the ground. And when you don't appoint them, the same people will st come back to you and tell you you have not, even though there is a Karaja there in the cabinet, but they will tell you you can't see our people there. Mm. Because our people is not the any other uh, somebody, if you are talking of central Kenya, mm. it's not just any name that comes from central Kenya, but uh, people who have actually eaten, and maybe they have shared a bit of what they are eating with us. Mm. Uh, so those are our people. So it's a challenge, an ethical issue, right from even our families, uh, the way we, we deal with our families, because if I'm bribing a police officer on the road and I have my child with me there, mm. what am I telling them? Uh, that is good to... Uh, so even as the Gen Z's look at, I know they succeeded on the reject finance bill. Mm. I think the next move, the next revolution, which I, I think it should come from the president himself, the Gen Z's have led their revolution. The president should lead the ethical revolution and the moral rebirth uh, because that is the challenge. Can he? Yes. Can, and I'm not talking about desire. I'm talking about ability. Can he actually lead a revolution when it comes to values and ethics and morals in this country, whereby we see that so many things happen in broad daylight and are not punished, are not brought to book? Can he actually lead revolution where he says, OK, guys, everything I'm shooting from the hip here and I'm going to take this bull by the horns? Can he? Yes, he can. And I think the president has on a number of occasions said uh, that he is committed to transforming this nation. Mm. So I want to believe that he is able to do that and he has the desire to do that. Maybe the situation before was not ripe. And now uh, the Gen Z's have given him uh, 
an uh, open check a, a new lease of life yes a new lease of if he started that a few weeks ago as i said it uh, he would have been alone but if it started today mm. maybe his friends will depart him but the rest of the 50 million kenyans will be behind him to support him in that revolution mm. yes you know the the thing about change is that it's characterized by the resistance that people have towards it people are loath to change they we as human beings you call it the comfort zone yes we we actually do not like or we do not enjoy change mm-hmm. and unfortunately the only time we change is when if i may use the imagery we have a gun to our heads mm. or circumstances force you to consider that process of of change the the accountability factor for me <clears throat> has been the biggest win in this entire discussion because mm. it's the thing that has lacked mm. if you look at our our politics and our and our position and if you look at some of the decisions that you look at presidents and if you then understand what they had to go through trying to understand the presidency through the eye of a president and trying to contextualize it you realize that some of those very difficult decisions that presidents have grappled with mm. have had to do with something that is probably intended as good sometimes for him sometimes for those who are around him or his, or their perception mm. of what they think the country needs but every once in a while you find the country is put in a position where they have the opportunity to reset and a country that has that opportunity is a very fortunate country and we are one such fortunate country mm. because other countries don't have this latitude to reset don't have an opportunity Strong. to do so no. don't have the freedom Strong. of speech no. No. don't have the freedom of assembly to no. then be able to come out and say we're mm. calling out a mm. president yes. on certain things and we ask you to toe the line and more importantly a president who even responds Mm. 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 It's true. Does he have a choice? Jeremiah. Uh I as I think as we have said if we are to serve this this nation I don't think there are many choices on the table. Uh if and and it's very unfortunate when you look at uh, because again this is not only a Kenyan problem. Mm. Uh which I don't know how Uh, that happens is actually have an, an entire continental challenge mm. we look at well, among the biggest economies we have in this continent uh without mentioning names uh, <laughs> but you we actually just say it, nigeria uh-huh. <laughs> or, yes, do, or did you, you mean south africa <laughs> <laughs> take you your pick to, yes. you go to that country and find almost everything is is not working Uh, right from the airport <laughs> you run for Sorry. you are you are playing like you are running for a matatu everything is dysfunctional <laughs> yet uh, the country we are told uh, in terms of the gdp is one so then you wonder what is the issue mm. and the issue only boils to one problem the issue of ethical leadership absolutely uh, so until when we address that monster as a country and as a continent we still have so that's why i'm saying uh i think this is a golden opportunity that we have now mm. an opportunity to reset and uh just give another life to this nation mm. and sometimes they say opportunities come once in a lifetime i think for us we have been privileged we have gotten these opportunities a number of times yes and unfortunately we have not utilized them very well in the past so i'm very sure i and i want to hope i want to believe that the current president uh, one he has demonstrated he is listening uh, you have not had any other time a president even going to meet people on social media uh, this is unprecedented so i want to believe that he is a listening president he, we is not many times we have had uh, the president uh, said in his entire cabinet home I think the only time I can remember is during the Kibaki era after the refrada. Uh, those things don't happen that often. Uh, so by that demonstration I want to believe that our president is a pre- is a listening president and these are some of the things uh, in my imagination uh, that he is trying or thinking about how can he take advantage of this current situation and set this country 
in a good platform once and for all and that will uh, make his legacy and uh, i know there are issues i i listen and i followed up uh on the uh ex mm -hmm. uh when he was uh, uh dealing the gen z uh, i also i always always log in to the ex uh, yeah. just to listen uh, what the young people are saying and among the many statements that have come there and some told him to his face uh, and even when uh, we had the interviews by media people in state house uh, one of the questions they asked him uh, president when will you stop lying and mm -hmm. all that those mm -hmm. kind of things uh, and i think the president have come out very clearly and saying uh, some there could have been errors in the past but those are some of the things that he has focused on rectifying and i'm very sure that uh, given this situation uh, we don't have many options mm -hmm. but take that route of uh, rebuilding the public trust you know i actually do not think that this should be left to the president mm. the job of running a nation is too big for one person mm. it's huge that is the reason why you have the three arms of government and then you have the fourth estate mm. i think that the opportunity and what we have seen is that before we develop embed and entrench a culture of accountability anybody in leadership any leadership must be held to account because it isn't just the political realm where you found people who do not wish to be held to account mm. it's a kenyan culture mm -hmm. the moment you're in a position of authority where when you wakusema as we say mm -hmm. it is you who is the begin and end all mm -hmm. so when it comes to holding leaders to account and they take it as the norm because right now if you ask me the political leadership is fighting it yes because they would rather be where they were before where they do exactly what, what they, they like been, yeah. mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. now so it means the change that we're speaking of has not been entrenched mm. and if an opportunity is provided or opportunity provided itself where people can go back to factory settings they will mm. go back to factory sure, settings sure. now the constitution of kenya we are unfortunate we are rather we are fortunate mm -hmm. enables us to understand that we are not subservient to the people we elect they are the ones who are subservient to us because they are our workers it is us who we we are the sovereign mm. now if the sovereign does not per perform their function because you have a duty as well mm. The blame game of so-and-so is to blame so-and-so is to blame. No, no. We have this unique moment where we can take hold of this situation that we find ourselves in mm. and work it out well. Mm. Find mechanisms of ensuring that even at the most basic level of leadership, whether it is in the local church, mm. whether it's in the local uh, leadership, the, the chairman of, of the cattle dip, wherever it is mm. that that accountability is something that we embrace because mm. if if we embrace it then anyone who aspires to leadership will know that they're going to be held to account that's true what would happen if we don't take advantage of this of this opportunity and you know sometimes for us to not see that we can actually push something we need to actually see the negative outcomes of not uh, behaving you know when you go to the doctor and they say oh this needs to happen you need to have this surgery mm. if you don't do it mm. this and this and this will happen you continue with more pain the situation will deteriorate and we have to chop off your leg kind of mm. thing yes so sometimes we need to see that negative outcome in order mm. for us to take a positive action now mm. so what would happen in this situation where a golden opportunity has been presented for better governance for better country for better operations if we don't take it what 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 would the result be I think uh, it's very clear and it has been mentioned by many people uh, and I have listened even the president himself uh, previously uh, addressing some of these challenges and where uh, we are headed and what we must do. Uh, very many government officials. Uh, I think sometimes the only challenge is that uh, and that is what bedevils this country. Mm. We, have, we know what needs to be done. Mm. but doing it sometimes become a bit of a challenge yeah. for some reason because if we don't do that the current generation uh, that we are dealing with that is in the street uh, we are talking of people most of them uh, below uh, 30 years they are below 30 years most of them uh, 
okay, they may pass and we go to another election, we go back to our tribal issues and all that, but that is not the end of it. We'll keep on having this challenge year in, year out. Mm. The biggest risk that we face is going to be a failed state where we have, when you look at what happened on Tuesday, for example, mm -hmm. the demonstrations that happened, you yeah. look at Kitagela, mm -hmm. uh, that clearly tells you uh, when you follow some of those things, you actually see it was, there are people who are peaceful demonstrations, uh, we are in peaceful demonstration, very genuine, but again, the others who took advantage of that, you are heading towards lawlessness mm -hmm. as a nation. Mm -hmm. So if we don't address this issue, uh, because we have a very, we have a youthful population. And this youthful population, there are people who are frustrated. Uh, somebody have gone down a degree yeah. for years. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have a job. They are educated uh, and they don't have a job. I saw one of, one of the young people on the social media saying, uh, you know, because we don't have a job, we don't have jobs. Our job is to demonstrate. Now that's the situation we are in. That there are people, I saw also another, uh, another one on social media say, uh, you know, some of us, uh, we don't have a job, we don't have a wife, we don't have children, we don't have companies to worry with. So even if I die, uh, actually one went ahead to say that I have even attempted suicide a number of times. Mm. So if you kill me, you have just assisted me. <laughs> in this that misery. is a kind of desperation. And you don't want to be in a situation where the majority of your population they don't care whether the country burns, whether you kill them, they don't care. So I'm not seeing many options. Uh, we have to get to that conversation and address. And the reason I don't want again to use very com uh, the word conversation a lot because it's not even a conversation. It's just picking what you already know should mm -hmm. work because mm -hmm. we know it. Mm -hmm. We have constituted many task forces, committees, commissions. There are reports piling up. Uh, actually, some of the countries just come to Kenya and collect our recommendations and go and implement them. And they, those recommendations work for them. It's just a matter of picking what can work, what we need to revisit. Uh, do we need to relook at our governance? Is it too expensive to sustain, for example, mm -hmm. which I honestly think it is? Uh, we need to look at some of those so that we are able to relieve some of the resources uh, from supporting a few. Uh, when you look at our wage bill, for example, and you hear what percentage of the taxpayers goes uh, towards paying less than a million people yeah. uh, in the public service, we need to relook at some of those things. Otherwise, if we don't, we are headed towards a failed state, unfortunately. One of the best, in my opinion, economists mm. in this country, Abraham Rugo, Dr. Mm. Abraham Rugo, had mentioned that, uh, you know, we actually need to do that. We don't need to um, romanticize this thing. Mm. That people just actually need to get it together, put themselves in a room, because you have these experts mm. yourself. Mm. We have economists. We have mm. people who understand this thing. Mm. Put them in a room sort out this issue and present it back and say this is the way in which it needs to be done we don't have to make it a tears and a, you know love story kind of thing it's black and white it's brick and mortar it needs to just get done do you think even as we wrap up um, jeremiah that the president in his unique position right now not just as president but somebody who can actually deliver who this renaissance this birth to deliver this baby of a new way of doing things in this country in the position in which he sits does he understand or shouldn't he understand that you know what i can play on the politics but i've actually got to play on the side whereby it is absolutely 100 percent necessary for me to incorporate all these things that we've talked about in the last one hour yes i think i believe he can uh, because uh, there comes a time when you decide uh, because um, maybe you are thinking a, a lot about how do you get re-elected and all that. But we are in a situation where even finishing five years is becoming a problem yeah. with the current situation that we are in. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the hard decisions that have to be made is how to bring back the country. Right. Is how to have a sustainable country because we may not even have a country in five years' time even to hold those elections if we don't address those 
some of the issues. Mm -hmm. And as you have mentioned about experts, I agree with you. Uh, we need to look at, even as we think about the reconstitution of cabinet, could we also have cabinet secretaries who are actually members of professional bodies, bodies. who can be held accountable also by their... So we have as a requirement, legal requirement, you are cabinet secretary for roads. One of the requirements is that you must be a member of the engineering mm -hmm. uh, association. Mm -hmm. You are the AG, of course, for the AG, is, uh, that one happens, mm -hmm. and so many other areas. You are the secretary to the cabinet. There is a professional body for certified secretaries. Yes. You must be a member of the Institute of Certified Secretaries. Mm -hmm. You are the cabinet secretary responsible for HR matters. You must be a member of IHRM. So that you are also held into account uh, by your own professional mm -hmm. bodies, mm -hmm. uh, professional ethics and all that. So an answer to what you have asked, yes, uh, the president is able to do that. And I believe that he will do uh, because I don't foresee us having many options unless mm -hmm. we do what needs to be done. Should he cut down the cabinet to the minimum of 14? I know I have had those discussions about the size of the cabinet. Uh, while I am I'm an advocate of a lean governance, mm. but I can tell you majority of our resources are actually not lost because of the number of cabinet secretaries. Uh, 22 I don't think is a big number. Okay. Uh, majority of our resources are lost in corruption. In corruption. The other place that we need to address the issue of resources is parliament. And I know sometimes people don't like touching there, <laughs> but that is also, touched. yes, that is where <laughs> we need to address and also a devolved system. I mean, a breath of fresh air having this kind of a conversation where we're talking about brick and mortar things and not yes. romanticizing ideas, but it actually needs to be done. Mm. FCS Jeremiah Karanja is the CEO of, of the Institute of Certified Secretaries in Kenya. Thank you for being here this morning. It will be interesting to see what opens up in the next couple of days. But thanks for being a good sport in the hot seat of in the you. Situation Room. Thank you. Thanks, guys, for being part of the conversation throughout this morning. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day.